I'm Severin Bornstein. I'm a professor here at the Haas School of Business and co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas. I also teach a course in energy and environmental markets, so this is a very exciting evening for me. And uh, for the 20 or 30 of my students who are here tonight, who uh, will be next year reading parts of good derivatives uh, in the class. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Dean's Speaker Series with Richard Sander tonight. Um, I am really excited and proud to introduce Richard. Uh, who I only met for the first time this evening, but I have been following his work in environmental markets for many years. Uh, I'm partway through reading Good Derivatives. Uh, the first part, which is Richard's years in Berkeley and before, which are, and then I skipped forward to the environmental markets part uh, uh, because I wanted to get that read before tonight. It's a very interesting book. It tells the story of financial innovation, and how it has been a positive force, which is, I think, a story very much in need of telling, but that that positive force really relies on good design and good regulation of those markets. And uh, I think it's a, it's a full uh, story that is not getting enough uh, presentation. I think Richard is definitely the person uh, to make that case, given his background, which he will be able to fill you in on tonight, which a lot of stories and I think a lot of interesting lessons. Uh, if you're here, you probably already know Richard's bio, but I'll just tell you. He's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Environmental Financial Products, which specializes in, in inventing, designing, and developing new financial markets with a special emphasis on investment advisory services. EFP was established in 1998 and was the predecessor company and incubator to the Chicago Climate Exchange. Uh, the European Climate Exchange, and the Chicago Climate Futures Exchange. Uh, in October 2007, he was honored as one of Time Magazine's Heroes of the Environment uh, and called the father of carbon trading. Uh, for those of you, my students in the class, who have just begun the carbon trading part of the course <laughs> and are trying to figure out how much those carbon permits are worth in the electricity strategy game, he'll probably have some tips. Um, he's a distinguished professor of environmental fa finance at Guajau School of Management in Peking University and a lecturer in law at the University of Chicago Law School. And Richard and Ellen, his wife who are here, who is also here this evening, have also been very generous uh, providing support for scholarships for PhD students in climate and alternative energy at Berkeley Haas. So please welcome Richard Sander. <laughs> Thanks very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, first of all, it's just great to be here and to see so many former colleagues and, and current friends and uh, from uh, the last 40 years. It's been a very special moment for me to, to be back here. Um, this is a book uh, entitled, obviously, Good Derivatives, and, and I wrote it for several reasons. One, because my wife said it's time for you to write a book. Uh, <laughs> number two, my professor, uh, Ronald Coase, um, who I had lunch with a week and a half ago, who's 101 years oh. old. And he said that the trouble with the economists is they always assume there's a market. And, and, and it takes 10 years. Joe Pettis at Safeway will tell you that how long we worked and toiled to, to deal with an environmental market. These don't exist. We assume them for pedagogical reasons. And in my personal experience, it's taken 10 to 20 years to build that assumption and to make it valid. They don't appear like spontaneous combustion. Not only that, the, the thing that really triggered it, in addition to Professor Trump, my wife, was everywhere I turned in the last four years was something about derivatives and what it had done, how it had caused the great meltdown, and that every evil of the Western world comes from derivatives. Um, and I thought, this really is not a good take. And it doesn't come from like just uninformed uh, 
uh, common folks. It comes from people like Paul Volcker who proclaimed the only good financial innovation in the last 50 years was the ATF. <laughs> he thought that that was the top of financial inventive activity because you could actually draw on that. Forget about everything else in terms of home ownership and mortgages, which made people's lives better. Forget about dealing with acid rain and, and how it was cured and saved 10,000 lives. Forget about financing with the high yield market, the Ted Turners and the MCIs of the world. And all in a bundle. And even Joe Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner, same thing, complex derivatives, all of these things, stock options, all of them are somehow evidences which of the badness of the system. What's the problem and why do so many people in one way or the other damn these instruments and, and how do they all get thrown, thrown into one particular bucket? And financial innovation is generally put in a back burner. We don't know much about it. It tends to be wholesale and we don't hear too much about it. If you take a look at who is Henry Ford, I think most of you would say, you've got an idea about this guy. If I say to you, who's Luca <laughs> Pacioli? By the way, he's not in The Godfather. <laughs> this is not Luca Brazzi. He's, no, he's not related to him. I think there's probably very few people in this room who would know who Luca Pacioli is. Anybody know? <laughs> okay. So, so we've got one. No, wait, Jeff. <laughs> two. Okay, we've got two people. He's the father of accounting, okay? And, and basically wrote the first treatise on it. And basically that treatise outlined in the Venetian states how to get organized for business. And I think there would be very few people who would argue that the invention of accounting somehow has to take a back seat to mass production. They both were valuable, as was the invention of the limited liability corporation. But we really don't deal with financial inventive activity. They're not patentable, so the names don't jump out at you. And they're not retail products, so nobody knows who they are. But I would put forth the theory that a lot of the development of finance, the invention of exchanges, et cetera, these kinds of institutions have an important role, but they're not played well. Um, I put into the class good derivatives, or, or try to for purposes of the book, uh, those that are traded on organized exchanges around the world. And they have had a spectacular run at growth. Futures trading was roughly 13.7 million uh, contracts. When I started getting interested on, in the subject in 68 and 69, it hit a record at 13.7 million contracts. Last year was 22.3 billion contracts, which is a compound annual growth rate of 18% a year. The only thing that's grown faster in the world has been chip capacity. <laughs> Airlines, if you would have said it, we were sitting here to yesterday when I was teaching here in 1970, make a bet. What do you think is going to grow more, airline passenger traffic or derivatives? <laughs> you would have never picked derivatives. Not only if, if you take a look at that, so it really has a very, very big role, bigger, as I say, than do it. Plus the fact, if you take a look at market capitalization, of the three US exchanges, you get something like 31, 32 billion dollars. This is not including <coughs> subsidiaries of NASDAQ, like the Philly Options Exchange and other smaller exchanges. It's just the big ones. They've got a market cap of, of 31, 32 billion. Compare that to 
the market capitalization of the major airlines in America. <laughs> it's a cheap shot, but I am shameless, <laughs> particularly with American Airlines at, at $165 million and in bankruptcy. But even if you put it up to United Continental, it wouldn't be the size of the market capitalization. Market cap, and I know you have a lot of students here, and there are a bunch of you guys, is really nothing more than a marginal cost of creating an exchange. It is not the value of the exchange. The value of the exchange <coughs> is measured by several capabilities. One is the management of risk, right? The farmer who, you know, plants corn in the spring and, and can hedge what that product will be worth during harvest. Somebody who has a bond issuance and wants to protect against interest rate rises, they can fix it now in the future. People who are doing the same thing in equity markets, in, in precious metals, etc. So the first is to manage risk. The, the second it is not only to manage risk, but, but to provide what we call price discovery. The value of a market in price discovery is to, for the farmer to know what a price of something is going to be worth at some time in the future. The third thing that, that they're valuable for, they're places to buy and sell a physical commodities, corn, bonds, stocks, things like this. They require hedgers. And they require speculators. Speculation is another bad word, right? This is the, the, all the guys in Wall Street, they did it. This is a terrible thing. Um, Joe Kennedy Jr. wrote an article yesterday that it's $5 gas because of speculators. We hear this is a common target, everybody. I have to tell an old Berkeley story. When I came here in 1966, <laughs> There was a great economist by the name of Abba Lerner. Uh, Bill, you may remember. He was, you know, he wrote a book called The Economics of Control. And he was a real lefty. I mean, a socialist model, living, you know, planned economy, stuff like this. And he learned that I was trading commodities. And I ran into him at, at some particular time. And, and I thought, geez, I'm speculating in commodities. This is certainly a target for him. How could you have a speculator? And he said to me in a private conversation that he thought speculation was really good. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, let me tell you a story about the, in the 30s. In 1930s in Spain, um, Franco was having a problem because grain prices were rising and rising. And they were blaming the speculators. So Franco said, I'm going to solve the problem. And he said, let's hold a meeting in the square in central Madrid and bring in all of the speculators and we'll stop all of this. And so we organized the meeting. They all came, and he killed them all. And it worked, because they, they all sold all the grain they had, right, the families, to survive. Grain prices went down, and he stopped the price increases. Except the next year, there was a, a drought. And as a result of the drought and those speculative buffer stocks, it, there was widespread famine, OK? So speculators carry inventories sometimes which help balance price inflation and deflation. In the commodity world, there is a very di big difference between gambling and speculation. In gambling, you create the risk for utility and pleasure. There is no risk before the racetrack is built. There's no risk before the casino is built. It's manufactured risk. In futures, whether they be bonds or soybeans, et cetera, the risk already exists of those commodities going up or down. The question is, who bears the risk? Is it done by a professional market maker? Or does the person, the farmer, the 
bond issuer have to bear it themselves. And in this case, these markets facilitate <coughs> risk transfer. How do these good derivatives come about? And if, if you take a look at, at them, kind of in the experience that I've had, they tend to seem to go through seven stages. Uh, I don't know why, but if you go back to, they take four markets, for example. Take the first limited liability corporation, which was the Dutch East India Company. Take, in fact, the first grain contract, which was wheat at the border trade in the 19th century. Take the first mortgage-backed security market, Ginny Mays, in 1970 and take SO2, the right to emit a property right. And if you take a look at those four commodities, they seem to share, and I picked them for a specific reason, shameless <laughs> as I am. Number one, the first is the security, the Dutch East India Company. The second is a commodity, wheat. The third is a fixed income instrument, bonds, and the fourth, is a property right, and all of them seem to go. So you get a massive structural change. In the Dutch East India Company, it was the opening of the trade routes with the East, Marco Polo, all of that stuff. The result of that was the invention of the Limited Liability Corporation. You prior to that had pro basically partnerships, and you couldn't transfer shares in partnerships, so securities were, were basically born. After that happens, they, they begin to get standardized. You create evidences of ownership because you don't trade stocks, you don't trade commodities, you don't trade bonds, you trade evidences of ownership. You develop informal markets. Exchanges come about. Complex derivatives, which Joe Stiglitz doesn't like. Um, futures, <coughs> options, things of this nature. And then subsequently, a proliferation of over-the-counter deconstructed markets. And if you go through wheat, in that case, the structural change was the Crimean War. You had to invent grain trading standards and the border trade involved in those. And you hold up a, a piece of wheat and you looked at it. And was it hard red or not? You could tell the protein content. You looked at infestation. You threw the grain up in the air, and if it was waterlogged, it fell to the ground first. So you had, you know, content about what a bushel was, and all of these things became necessary. And if you go through every one of them, that's how they arrive. What, after they do arrive, you know, <clears throat> I want to tell you what the benefits are, but I want to tell you about three of them because, as far as I'm concerned, it's a Berkeley story, the three that, that I was involved with, you know. And, and one of them is electronic trading, which began here in 19... <laughs> Earl Crabb remembers it well back in those days. Um, the other was interest rate futures, which was a Berkeley product. And the third was event futures, um, catastrophic futures on hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, and things like that. It all came out of, which I was saying to Rich Lyon, um, what essentially what I thought was a boundless environment uh, that Bill Roberts and Dave Acker and a number of us lived in in the 60s and David Pyle. You could do anything you wanted on this campus. And I mean, it was really boundless. And, and I'm not talking about free love, you know, uh, uh, or, or the, the woman's revolution. But, uh, you know, the other big revolution that here was capital markets. It's really hard to think. You know, you'd go through and they're toiling away in Barrows Hall where a number of us looking at finance as something that might change things. Um, and I will tell a personal story, and then I'll, I'll get into it, and we'll try to talk about some economic benefits. And I really want to just share stories and questions with the students, because I'm, I'm a teacher, and I want to answer those questions. Um, 
I got here and, and one of the freedoms was I was interested in industrial inventive activity. And then uh, Fred Arditi, who uh, was a colleague of mine, I had started trading stocks in the 60s. And I thought I was really good, you know, but, you know, I was really bad. You couldn't, you couldn't help but buying a stock and watch it go up, particularly in the high tech era of the 60s. It was a bull market. And if you bought any stock in Silicon Valley, you made money. So I pursued it to have a great run. And so somebody said, geez, you're a good trader. No, wrong. By the way, I eventually lost everything I made. Okay, so he said, why don't you trade commodities? And so I started thinking, well, I trade commodities. So how do you, to really learn something, you teach it. So I asked the dean if we could introduce a, a course on futures trading. Prior to that, there were never any in business schools. It was only ag economists that, that learned these markets. So I think it was Dick Holden at the time said, you know, yeah, you can teach your course in commodity futures. And so I read everything about it. I learned the history of the Dutch East India Company, the border trade. I studied it all and, and, and started trading. And I, I did OK, um, just OK. Then my broker said to me, and here's where we'll go very quickly with it, said, we, we want to start an exchange in San Francisco. And, you know, you seem to know something about computers and you know a little ab about markets, you've traded them. Why don't we get a grant from the Bank of America and you do a feasibility on, on futures uh, market here in San Francisco. The problem was there were no professional traders. So we said, let's do it electronically. So. And Earl was involved in this. So we drew up, this is now, this is 1968, okay? And we said, let's try to computerize trading. So we drew up this system flow chart about how markets could be electronic. And I teamed up with a guy by the name of Barry Sachs, who was in the electrical engineering computer science, and he did the hardware feasibility study. Remember, this is before there were personal computers. So we had cathode ray tubes. You had to attach it to a modem, right? Build it, and I did a d dissertation on an IBM 1620. I don't know, it's an, an iPad is a lot more capacity than that, that which was filled with room two sites. So we said, do it. And you can imagine how insane it was any place but in Berkeley, right? The, the fact that you could envision a day when everything would be done electronically. So we got a $15,000 grant, which paid for three research assistants, my salary, and four trips to Chicago and Washington, um, and wrote this feasibility study. Um, eventually, you know, I really want to kind of share with you something I think is very important, particularly to students. Uh, a lot of the stuff, that whatever small degree of success I've had, it's because I've failed a lot, okay? And I learned from the failures. And there's no such thing as a failure if you're a scientist. It's a clinical trial gone wrong, okay? <laughs> there's a famous story of something called Salvacin 606. It was a sulfur drug in, at the turn of the century. It treated among things, venereal diseases, et cetera. It's called a, a Salvacin 606. And it was developed by a guy by the name of Ehrlich. And it was called 606 because he got it wrong 605 times. <laughs> and so <laughs> you have to keep on it. So let me fast forward 40 years later. Um, uh, they, and the exchanges are going public and they're going uh, electronic. And there's a big battle because somebody in New York bought up a patent called the Wagner patent, and was 
suing every exchange in America for infringing on electronic trading. So Ellen said to me, didn't you do this in Berkeley in the 60s? <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I called up the Institute of Business and Economic Research here, and I said, can I have a copy of that report we filed with you? And they said, no, no, there's no reports here. We can't find anything. It's, it's not, you know, it doesn't exist. I said, it does exist. So Ellen said, look, I think you saved one copy and bought it. This is a true story. And you, it's in the basement of the apartment in Chicago. And so I have three research assistants. I call up everybody. I call up Earl. I said, Earl, do you have any copy of that study? No, I don't know whatever happened to it. Anybody else ever see that study? No, the study doesn't exist. Um, he said, I know this study exists because I wrote it. The long and short of it is, without playing into the drama, it fell out of a broken box, literally. And the result of that was a lawsuit um, in which it really was what was developed in Berkeley, the total heart of what a Project CARB did in 69 here was the basis for electronic trading in terms of all of the things. It was a patent, and the exchanges were paid 10 or $20 million each for this patent, and uh, it was really a Berkeley product. It should have never been patented. It was in the public arena in the late 60s, and it was a $100 million deal that was buried in a research project. Uh, <laughs> so ultimately, I got a hold of Carl Shapiro, and it's now published on the, on the Berkeley website, and you can read it. It's the Project Feasibility Study, which contains a second thing as well, was the idea for, of a for-profit exchange which is what we recommended. And today, all exchanges are for-profit. They have been demutualized, and they followed the model that came in, into Berkeley. So I, I say that to you, to the students. There's no better time to fantasize. There's no better time to think about anything. Keep a blank slate. And this academic and this intellectual environment provides all you need. Do not ask people who are wizened <laughs> and, and just go with whatever gut instincts that you have. Um, 33 years after all of this, virtually all of the exchanges have been demutualized. All are electronic and no matter where they are. Why of interest? Because they all came out of this Chicago model, which came out of Berkeley, which now exists with 78 derivatives exchanges around the world, in China and France and England and Hungary and Russia, in South Africa, in the United States. Not one nickel of TARP money, okay? No bailouts, no systemic risk, and derivatives have done everything bad. These transparent, regulated markets perform flawlessly, and derivatives are now cast into this one large bucket. And they were originally applied and named derivatives to mean organized exchanges, and they're not really dealt with that. Um, the other thing that happened in the Berkeley story, and then I'll, I'll try to keep it within uh, bounds, we have plenty of some time for questions, is in 1969, um, I was trading commodities and teachers, and I had an office with a guy by the name, David, you remember Hank Schaff? And so Hank and I shared an office, and he said, you know, hey, there's a credit crunch in California. Um, the SNLs are running out of money. And, and I said, you know, I wonder if you could hedge these mortgages, you know? I mean, if there was a way to, to hedge against interest rate risk. And I put aside, I eventually got a hold of a guy by the name of Tom Bomar. Tom was a part of the California Young Turk group, and, and Tom 
And I met in 1971, he said, I, Freddie Mac just surpassed a billion dollars in mortgages. And we're having this meeting to see if, if we can somehow get rid of this thing. Because we started Freddie Mac, and this is very important to all of you, only to create secondary market trading, never to be the permanent owner of the mortgages. I was the first CEO. I called up Tom and I asked him about the story. He said, I've been fighting with Barney Frank for the last 15 years. He says, this was not part of the charter. The US government was not to, meant to replace SNLs or mortgage banks. And that's why we started Freddie Mac, et cetera. So ultimately, um, that grew into a feasibility study. I took a portfolio of loans from a guy by the name of Tony Frank, who converted mutual SNLs to stock owned, tried to grade mortgages, failed, because at that time, there was redlining. If you were divorced, you, you, your loan-to-value ratio was different. If you were a woman, your loan-to-value ratio was different. If you were African-American, it was different. You couldn't homogenize mortgages because the underwriting state, state is discriminated between anybody other than a white male who, was, who had a family. And if you didn't fall into that category, the risk premiums were just unaccountable statistically. You couldn't do it. Anyway, the government formed Ginny May, <laughs> Professor Jaffe, uh, under Sher Mizell. I read about it in the paper in 71, called up first Boston. The guy came. I had taught this commodity course, and I went on to Chicago. And uh, they asked me if I'd become chief economist. and, and I asked uh, Dick Holden if I could take a sabbatical, and I would just be gone for a year, um, and that I wanted to see if, if I could work as the chief economist of the Board of Trade. But I had an idea that I thought that there could be financial futures and options and, and whatnot. So I trotted off to Chicago. I got thrown out of every big bank in America that said I ought to go back. Could you imagine being a Berkeley professor <laughs> In the 60s, okay, they basically go back to school and smoke dope, okay? <laughs> that, that, that this is not, in fact, the way of the world. Interest rates don't fluctuate, and there's no need to hedge. That's what I was told. Then 73 occurred. The Arab oil embargo sent inflation rocketing. Interest rates walked like this. I call up. Dick and I said, I need another year. <laughs> um, and then we tried to do it. Do what? We tried to get this thing tamed and whatnot. And, and I'll finish with this and then go on to California. Um, what was the problem was mortgages were a security. They weren't, and yet there was no Commodity Futures Trading Commission. So the market of the 70s caused an uproar in Washington, D.C. And, and of course, go back and fast forward, who caused high food prices? Speculators. What's the solution in America? You know you've arrived when you get your own regulatory agency, right? So, so the Senate started to think about the CFTC. As chief economist of the Board of Trade, and I tell the story, it's a little more exciting than I'm telling it now. I work with Phil Johnson, and we included one word in the act enabling commodities to be traded. We said, define it as anything tangible or intangible. And as a result of that, we got to look at stock indexes and bonds and treasury notes as intangibles. And we were very careful to call them goods and services, not stocks and bonds. And the result was the SEC missed it. Um, the Friday before we were going to start financial futures, they brought an injunction against the Chicago Board of Trade and said, you can't do that. And we said, look at the legislation. We footnoted it. We spent two years documenting it. it. said it was in the Federal Register. 
You should have spotted it. It gave exclusive jurisdiction to this new agency, and thus financial futures and options were born. Let me conclude on the value. Yeah, and, and that also includes SO2, carbon dioxide, NOx, water, any airborne or any other kind of pollutant is a commodity as far as the CFTC is, is concerned. What was the benefit of all of this? It's great, you can say, okay, as economists, you can say we're shifting rents around, but the, the bid-ass spread, and I speak to the students now, and particularly the finance people, in Ginny Mays, when they first started, it was 98 bid at 100, David. It was 2% bid offer spread. When we started futures, it shrunk to a half. What, for those of you that aren't professional economists, if you've ever traveled and bought and sold a currency when you went traveling, you might notice that the price at which you buy and sell that currency is very wide. It's a hidden cost. Well, Ginny May costs that big spread from where you buy and sell them, which was a cost of doing business, shrunk from two points to a 30 second. The result was that relaxation saved a homeowner, a homeowner $6,000 in mortgages over the life. Given the average salary of an American worker is $45,000, $6,000 is a lot of money to save. In addition to that, these markets are heavily fought by established interests. You can imagine going into New York and going to an investment bank or to somebody else who had a monopoly on this and said, hi, I'm here from Chicago and I'm here to narrow your spreads. It's not a popular position. Having a transparency is your main weapon. If you have a strong vested interest in opaqueness, you really don't welcome people who promise to open it up. Okay, and so these markets are typically rejected. They're typically fought because they disenfranchise some people and the transparency is better for the consumer and better for the investor. I want to fast forward to a last bit so we have 15, 20 minutes for questions and let me go through. We applied this concept to the Chicago Climate Exchange to trade CO2. It was the same sort of thing. We developed a voluntary market in that. Ultimately, Safeway, Joe Pettis is here. We had 17% of the Dow Jones, um, all on a voluntary basis. We had DuPont, IBM, Intel, United Technologies, Honeywell, Safeway, Ford, 20% uh, of the power companies. And we did fantastically. We were a third of the size of Europe with no law. It was strictly a voluntary market. Our members cut 400 million tons, which is bigger than the total emissions of France. Guys like Joe substituted diesel in their trucks for biodiesel. There were companies, IBM, that changed the way it etched its crystals and chips. There were companies like DT&E that changed their turbines. There were renewable energy. There were 15,000 farmers. We had an entire range of every kind, and it worked. Just to conclude, California is a leader, okay? And it, whether you like it or not, Facebook, okay, women's rights, you know, Nazi and communist parties on campuses like this, it always allowed the free movement of ideas. As I said to Rich Lyons, it's boundless for good or bad, whether it's social networking, Hollywood, games. It starts here and it goes the other way. Maybe it's because we're 3,000 miles from Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> but the fact is, the idea is you have a unique opportunity now, and this is something that's very meaningful to, to me. 
The United States has been marginalized in, in climate change issues and in market uses to solve them. Even though we invented it, it's now thrown out as a bad derivative. Okay, even if you solve the problem, like you did with acid rain, it's not good because somebody is making money from it. And I firmly believe, and it's your time and your generation, that, that if you incentivize people to do something in the public interest, that's good. That's a good derivative. That's not a bad thing. That balancing social needs and objectives with personal incentives are the right way. We're not all mother to races. And we've got a big problem in this environmental issue. And, and particularly to the students, it's your world, OK? I've got grandkids. And, and somehow these problems are going to be dealt with. And unless California leads the way, I will tell you that I get better reception and more. China will become the world's leader in this area. There are four, province, four cities and two provinces that have pilot cap and trade. I was in Rio de Janeiro three weeks ago. They're going to all use markets. We have China, Brazil, and India all using markets and derivatives to solve their environmental problems. And it ain't happening here except for California. And it's up to <laughs> you guys to, to really get it right. And you have a chance to do something transformational here. It's not silly. It's the last hope. The Western Climate Initiative is a serious piece of business. If you get it right, you'll knock some heads and, and rack the vested interests in both the left and the right who don't want to see this happen. And there's an opportunity here. Um, and I want to end by just telling you uh, these kinds of ideas may seem radical, and it may seem that Californians should, shouldn't have done it or, or be doing it, and I can only say to you in all sincerity, I had some crazy dreams 40 years ago. You can do whatever you can imagine. You know, you the students, you have an infant capacity to affect change. And this is a very important, air and water are going to be the critical commodities of the 21st century. And if we learn how to manage them with proper incentives, we will continue to lead the world. If we go back to command and control societies and have bureaucratic administration of our public resources, I don't think it would be good. So. Thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to be back home again, and, and thanks. <laughs>problem occurred in the 90s, um, the end part of it, and the government was going to regulate certain kinds of energy contracts, and as a result of the efforts of Enron, they, it was stalled. And um, I think that we're learning now that that was not the right move, and, and much of Dodd-Frank tries to address that big unregulated swath of the market. And it's a tough balance because some of the, uh, there are some of the self-regulated markets like interest rate swaps and foreign exchange which performed brilliantly during the great meltdown. Okay, and, um, and these tools that we have are always viewed as suspicion. Norman Maines is a former colleague of mine and a friend worked at the Fed in the 80s, and, you know, he didn't think much of financial futures, and then we, uh, you know, <laughs> he and Jenna came out, and then I tried to 
sell him a bill of goods, which <laughs> I didn't. He moved to Chicago. Um, and I think that we got to, you know, it's Chairman Volcker, and it's, it's the Senate and the House, and, and it's a pay-to-play model, and, and we need transparent, regulated markets. And, and, but yet, they're often fought uh, for different reasons, on, as you, you and I were talking before. Some of them on the left don't like it, because they think, ah, oh, that's terrible, you're making money from, from the environment. And then the right says, you're a bunch of lefties, you know, because you care about the environment. So we get killed on both sides, I mean, which is probably a good spot. I played tournament chess as a kid, and I was told that the center was where the game was won and lost. And if you play football, you know it's between the 40-yard lines that, that the game is won and lost. It's not won at the extremities. It's run in the center. And I think we've got to get back to the center for a lot of these solutions. So that's a political comment. <laughs> uh, yes? Do we need to uh, keep separate investment banks from commercial banks such as some economists, even at the Federal Reserve, suggested Glass-Steagall was a mistake in, in uh, moving beyond that. Uh, Frank Dodd kind of messes up a lot of things versus Glass-Steagall was principally to separate banking from commercial banking. Yeah, banking. Yeah, the, the question is, do we need to go back to separating commercial and investment banking? And it's a really tough question because Today you get a political solution. You have something called the Dodd-Frank bill. I, I make a statement about this at the end of the book. If you take a look at the Dodd-Frank bill, it's 2,100 pages. If you add up the Bible and the Gospels and the Old Testament and the Koran, it's less than Dodd-Frank. So that we run the three major religions in the world with less than a single piece of legislation dealing with financial institutions. I don't know what's in that bill, okay? I don't think anybody, there's a real simple way you could have stopped it. Just say different capital requirements. You want to speculate, that's fine. You go and speculate, but you put up 50% of the bank's capital against any position that's not related to your banking function. All you could have is a capital base, and you could do it in a page. The Federal Reserve Bank was created with 50 pages of legislation. The SEC with 200. The Clean Air Act with 300. Sarbanes-Oxley with 160. 2,100 pages in the Dodd-Frank. Do you think anybody except the arbitrageurs know what's in that bill? You, you, it's very complex, Jenna. So what are the bad derivatives, if those are the good ones? <laughs> I think the bad ones are, are all of the opaque OTC ones, where people don't look at what's underlying. And they're also based on bad underlying products. So how do we get rid of them? I think that they have got to be regulated. That you have to have full disclosure and, and rules like that with regard to. So for example, let me. A bad derivative is subprime, but subprimes were bad. Those were legislated into existence, basically. The, the, the banks were told you have to lend to, to people who really can't afford to buy this house. And so you then get a derivative on it, and nobody goes back to saying, wait a second, who said, who, who is behind creating subprime loans? So the answer is, You've got to have transparency, and I don't think there was any transparency in those subprime markets. And uh, the other thing is improper capital hits for things like credit default swaps. If you're going to right. ensure Greece mm -hmm. is, uh, is basically bet against the Greek default, you better put up enough capital and you have to basically make it capital-based rules for writing derivatives. So is that another 2,100-page bill? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. It's a good question, though, and it's Here, the right question to ask. Yeah. So 
I'm an entrepreneur that I need the environmental markets to function in order for my business to function. So I really want to hear your opinion as to what needs to happen in order to get carbon credit, water credits, and other type of environmental um, instruments out there in the market. Well, I, I, the, the question is, I'm an entrepreneur and I'd like to see, I depend on these environmental markets working. We need it for clean energy. We need it, you know, for renewables. We need unambiguous regulations to make it happen and happen right. It's not happening in Washington, D.C. Just forget it. Okay, which means it's down to regional programs like AB 32. It's going to be like California with seat belts. You've got to be first movers. You've got to get legislative clarity. The city of Oakland joined the exchange. Uh, the city of Berkeley joined. Safeway joined. You know, half of our members at CCX were, you know, west of the Mississippi, you know, some west of Washington. <coughs> but you need clear and unambiguous rules regarding property rights. <coughs> and the legislators just have to set the rules. And you can't change the rules in the middle of the game. If you change the rules in the middle of the game, you'll get no capital formation. Yeah. Following up on that question, something we talk a lot about in our environmental markets class is about mm -hmm. how difficult it is to have these markets work when the market size is per perhaps not optimal. So I don't think one would argue that California would necessarily be your first choice, but because of the regulatory environment, that's what we're left with. So how do you think, what would be the metrics that would come out of a California market that would convince the rest of the country or potentially the rest of the world to adopt these markets? If there's a potential of failure because it's not the right size or it's not the right environment? No, they, there's going to be people who are skeptical of it because of the general attitude towards markets today, towards derivatives and what they mean and the kinds of people who function in them. And sometimes they're, they're founded with, based upon compensation levels and other things that do occur. Um, I think that it has to just simply work. And, and you have to keep the lobbyists out of it, right? Because you get a group of vested interests that will, will basically try to wreck it and have it fail. And they can be on both sides, by the way. I don't reserve that for the right or the left. I mean, Lenin had Trotsky shot because he wasn't, you know, left wing enough, right? Or Stalin. You know, that kind of stuff, you know? I mean, th this stuff is, 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 has got pernicious ends of the spectrum. And I guess that I think if California gets it working, it's going to be like social networking and iPads and whatnot. You can put a certain degree of credibility that comes out of a creative solution. This is one of the largest economies in the world. We're not talking about, you know, a trivial exercise. We're talking, I don't know, what is it, 37, 38 million people? You know, eighth, ninth GDP, depending on where you're, you're doing it. This is a major lab. Plus the fact you've got Canadian provinces now that are very interested in hooking up with California. So you're going to have a multinational <coughs> experiment multinational experiment with one of the largest economies, top 10 economies of the world. And I think it's going to be very hard to throw out results which show that you can reduce emissions at a reasonable cost if you treat businesses the right way. Yes? What are some of the natural impediments in the measurement of the underlying talked a lot about you know, the basis risk associated with the futures market and being able for it to function properly. What are some of the natural impediments? Is it, are there areas that there could be fraud in the measurement? I mean, maybe my understanding of them is limited. I, I think the measurement is trivial. 
okay, and let me tell you why. With regard to a third of it, it comes out of utilities, and those are continuous emission monitors. We measured with CCX with 112 emitting members, 700 million tons of baseline, did the entire measurement and had it independently validated for a million and a half dollars a year. That was the total thing. And you submit bills, Safeway did the utilities, you submit the continuous emission monitoring. Does that mean there's not going to be fraud? Of course there's going to be examples, but you can't stop it. It's like pilot error or, you know, greed gone wild. This is a part of the system. You have risk. Some people will get it wrong. They will abuse the system and take economic rents which don't, you know, inure to them and they will do something. But the others are, ma are, are masquerades, you know. The, if you let the market work and you have it thoroughly regulated, you'll, somebody's going to sneak through, right? Somebody's going to be fraudulent, somebody's going to do something because the stakes are high. Hmm. You know, I was recently told by somebody at the FAA, I don't know if this is something, we, well, I'm on an airline kick for some reason tonight. You know that something like 40 to 45 percent of all airline crashes are due to the fact that they ran out of fuel? I mean, just think of that. You know, wait a second, I didn't ca get my gas. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you going to find error? Yes. Are you going to find fraud? Yes. Is it? It's like Winston Churchill and democracy. You know, it's it's just better than everything else that's out there. Is it flawless? No. But it's a better way to get to the objective if you look at the objective in the case of, of this case to reduce pollution. But the problem is a lot of the people in the, the players in that thing, it isn't their objective to reduce pollution at the lowest possible cost. It's a political agenda. It's another agenda. They don't come to look for an efficient solution to the problem beforehand. And they say, well, you know, but it's the people making money. And I say, well, you need to, to have a long conversation Sunday in your church about that, right? That, that's not the place. If you don't like the morality of it, that's a private decision that you should make, between, you know, at, at, your, at your church. You don't need to make it here right now. That's a separate issue. Let's separate the morality. Isaac Asimov said something very important. Never let your morality get in the way of doing what's right. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I think it's very important that you keep that focus and you'll get to the point where you want to get. Joe? Speaking of morality. <laughs> <coughs> Other than convincing Ellen to be your bride, yes, <laughs> what do you consider to be your your greatest personal or professional uh, sense of pride? Hmm. Oh, <laughs> I think that's for others to say, Joe, not for me. I, I really don't know. I think my greatest pride is my kids and my grandkids, and I I'd set them as the highest standards. Uh, they're good moral people. They care. They've had challenges in life and had big setbacks, and they've rolled with the punches, and they're an example to Ellen and I. And, and they've got serious grandchildren problems, and they just dealt with life and said, we're lucky to be here, and did it. So that's what I consider my treasure. Hmm. I really, go ahead. Take one last question. I get the, the, my boss was looking at me, so I figured I didn't. You said it for me. Thank you. Last question. Yes. G given your vast experience uh, with, with financial products and innovation, what do you think the next uh, big financial innovation may be uh, that we can expect this? I, I got a couple ideas. One, one I can't tell you about because I'm more Because I got an IPO in mind. <laughs> um, but I do think the, the big challenge is water. That, um, that the, the, we will, it is the oil of the 21st century. Uh, they're using up all of that Nebraska aquifer. It's only a matter of time. You can't farm corn. 
we've already having water wars in Colorado these days. I don't know if you saw it because of fracking and stuff like that. There's the farmers and the ranchers and the cities. We have a contract with the province of Alberta uh, to develop a water market because they're going to run out of water before they run out of oil. Okay. We were also in contact with the Palestinian uh, and the Israeli, the Holy Land Water Authority, which said, hey, we could solve this with commerce, not with guns, you know, and they're, you know, and if you take a look at, at the problem in South Sudan, it's a water problem and it's an energy problem. You know, we're, we're at a maximum pace of wars on the planet these days, and a lot of them are water-based. The Punjab is going gonna, is gonna to run out of water. I don't think Tibet is about religion. I think it's about water and the headwaters that go into India and China. And so I think the biggest thing is to resolve the allocation of water, because without it, there's no life. Endangered species, I think you could have markets for, for things. And, and so I think the, the idea is to use these markets for social objectives, medicine, education, water, that that's where the next challenge of the 21st century is, to commoditize those public goods and build incentives so we rebuild our infrastructure. It's great to be home here in Berkeley. Thanks all very, very much.